Thank you for joining us. I'm Altaf Merchant, the Dean of the Milgard School of Business. A big welcome to our panel discussion on women who run. This is presented by the Milgard Women's Initiative within our Center for Leadership and Social Responsibility. One of the programs of the Milgard Women's Initiative offers is a speaker series featuring women who lead in the South Sound area. Today, we are honored to have a distinguished panel of elected officials joining us to share their experiences and leadership lessons. I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of today's panel discussion, Donna Quanipinto. Donna is the president and CEO of the United Way of Pierce County. She joined United Way of Pierce County in 2014, bringing years of experience within United Way Network and a long history of working on behalf of children and their families. Donna is very active in the community, engaging with public and business leaders and agency partners. I would like to give a hearty Milgard School welcome to Donna, who will introduce the panelists today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dean Merchant. I'm so pleased to be a part of today's program. So, but first, a quick comment on our format. We're going to have 50 minutes for our discussion, concluding at 1.20. Uh, I'll begin with questions to our panelists and then pivot to questions that are coming from the audience. So please, please, please email your questions to clsr at uw.edu, which is shown on your screen. So today, I am honored to introduce our panel members. Um, I know each of these wonderful women personally and just looking so forward to the discussion today. So first, we're joined by Speaker of the Washington State House of Representatives, Lori Jenkins. Lori was first sworn into the House of Representatives in 2011 and then made history in 2020 when Lori became Washington State's first woman and first lesbian Speaker of the House. Next is Washington State Senator Tawana Nobles. Tawana was sworn into office in 2011, 20, I'm sorry, 2021, and is the first Black State Senator to serve in a decade. Prior to the Senate, Tuana was elected as director of University Place School Board. Next, Pierce County Auditor, Julie Anderson. Julie has held the position of Pierce County Auditor since 2009. Prior to her current position, Julie was elected and served as council member for the Tacoma City Council. And last, City of Tacoma Mayor, Victoria Woodards. Victoria became mayor in 2018 and has been reelected for a second term. Prior to becoming mayor, Victoria was elected and served as council member for the Tacoma City Council. Many thanks to each of you for joining us today. So now I have the first question uh, that is uh, for all of you, but I'm gonna start off with Lori. So thinking about your current career, what led you to your current career? What were some of the lessons that you learned early on? And you know, what were some of those rookie mistakes, some things that you would do differently? Thanks, Donna. It's great to be here um, with you. And uh, thanks, Dean Merchant, for making this possible. I'm really excited to be here with this uh, great group of women uh, who are all friends. Uh, and I think you're going to find that um, for women who are interested in running, uh, we make connections with each other all over the place. Um, for me, you know, I grew up in a very, very small town and I learned a lot of things in my small town upbringing. You know, we, in my town, uh, you couldn't put on a play, you couldn't have a softball team, you couldn't play in the band unless everybody participated. Uh, and so participation in the community was, became really important. But one of the other things that taught me is um, being willing to take risks because I was not the best trombone player at all, <laughs> but I did it because my community needed to have another trombone player. I might've actually, it might've been counterproductive, I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, you know, those were things I learned early on as a kid, but then um, as I got 
um, older and um, got out of law school, I mean, really for me, my engagement in LGBTQ politics really motivated me, my service on nonprofit boards throughout the community and my work in public health, all of those things came together to really interest me, interest me in policy making. Um, uh, I don't want, I could talk, I, I think you said that I get 50 minutes, um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I guess I'll just say, I just want to say a little bit about what I've learned early on. My biggest lesson that I and that I share with people a lot is that if you think you might want to run for office, you should do the things you love. You should always do the things you love because you'll do them better. You'll become known for doing them well, and it will open more doors for you to do other things. And that's the thing that builds the capacity to run for office. So I'm just a very strong believer in doing what you love. Thank you so much. You're absolutely right. Doing the things you love. And so, Victoria, what about you? What led you to your current career and what lessons did you learn? What would you do differently? Well, again, thank you uh, to Dean Merchant for having us. And it's really exciting to be amongst all of these um, women this afternoon. Um, I'm especially excited that Lori Jenkins and I are twinning today. Um, so. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's so funny as, as I look back, having grown up here in Tacoma and a lot of people have heard my story, you know, kind of about how I got here. But what is, what is interesting to me is, um, I didn't really have, I didn't think as a kid, I didn't know I wanted to be a mayor. I never said when I grow up, I want to be a mayor. I want to be in politics. Um, I just always found my way to service. And I love what Lori said about the fact that love what you do. And I just had a heart for service. I was happiest and have always been happiest in my life when I'm taking care of someone else. Um, and so I knew I wanted, I knew I wanted a life of service. And so um, I think everything I did led me up to this moment. I'm also a person of faith and, and very honest about my faith. And so I, I just also believe in being led um, by what is for me. And, and so um, in high school, um, I joined the military. Everybody, I mean, a lot of people have heard the story, but I joined the military to serve my country and to see the world and got stationed right here at Fort Lewis, Washington. So I was always destined, I believe, to be here at home. Um, and then just went through life having worked for corporate America. Um, and, and then I think the greatest turning point for me was when I went to work at the Urban League as the assistant to its president where I really truly learned what service was and how being of service, how waking up every day and thinking about how to change people's life could truly have an impact on the community in which I lived. And so then having met Harold Moss and realizing and working for Harold Moss, um, so I, I still have a hard time saying the late Harold Moss, um, but working for him and realizing that policy really was a place where you could shape the future and be of service, especially to be in rooms where others who sometimes looked like me um, or who had my life experience were not. And so, um, but, but I did say when I worked for Harold, I never wanted to be an elected official. So um, I didn't think that was my path, but of course that higher power said something different. I ended up getting elected to the park board, then running for city council and now being Tacoma's mayor. Um, but I just, I just want to make a difference. So, and, and, and it's what I love to do. Um, what have I learned? Um, what, what I've learned, especially in politics is that um, to try not to take it personal, although it's really hard not to, when you put yourself out there to run, um, it's hard not to, when someone comes to a council meeting and says, you didn't, and it's hard not to take that personal because it is you, but they're talking to you, the system, not you, the individual. Um, and so, so not to take things personal. And I think in running, a lot of people will say they're going to be with you, but life gets in the way. So when you make a decision to run or to be an elected official, it must be your decision. You've got to be the one who commits to it because even though everybody else wants to be there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they're not the ones making the commitment. And so, you know, as, as Lori said, when I think about people who want to run for office, you decide to run, make the commitment on your own, and then try not to take it personal, although it will feel extremely personal um, as you get in it. Um, and so that th those are the things I learned, and um, I'm happy just to get into the rest of the conversation with my colleagues this afternoon. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And so, Julie. 
How about you? What led you to your current career and lessons that you learned early on? Uh, well, my job is as Pierce County Auditor right now. And uh, I, I definitely followed Lori's advice about doing what you love and um, finding your joy and had a very, very eclectic uh, career um, from criminal justice and human services, social justice, uh, and then into local government and public service. I guarantee you though, that nobody grows up thinking I wanna be an auditor. Um, first of all, nobody knows what an auditor actually does. <laughs> and, uh, true, yeah. that, true that, Julie. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, for viewers that may not know what the county auditor does, um, we manage elections, um, public document recording, marriage licensing. I used to run animal control. It's a real grab bag, but the attention getter is always elections, right? Um, so through that um, really diverse career, I, I, what I found is that I was attracted to um, executive positions where the buck stops with you and you have to make hard choices and lead people uh, through really complex situations and um, lead the charge under pressure. Um, but I started in the Tacoma City Council uh, in my elected service, uh, which is a legislative branch, which is not executive service. <laughs> so I learned a lot of things uh, serving on the Tacoma City Council, like the legislative branch isn't necessarily for me, but what called me to um, the City Council was um, being an end user of the public policy that was created there. At the time, I was the director of the YWCA. And, um, I can remember testifying and trying to shape local legislation and feeling feeling like people were really disconnected from the citizens that were calling upon them. And I really wanted to be part of changing the relationship between local elected officials and citizens. Uh, so that was part of my calling. Um, things that, and, and now I'm in a perfect spot. I love being Pierce County Auditor because I have that direct management responsibility plus the people part, plus the public policy part. Um, but things I learned along the way uh, in this position and on the Tacoma City Council is that emotional management is absolutely key, not just for your success, but also for the well being and success of the citizens that you're representing. Um, I don't know who said this, um, some leadership guru, but um, a, a leader's number one responsibility is controlling their own emotions. Um, and it's how you show up. Um, and then a big tactical lesson that I've learned along the way is think in four years and 10 years, not one year. <laughs> so gravitating towards those bills, um, through to those ordinances that are that you think are going to be one or done or set policy on the track, uh, just realize that it's going to take layers and layers of laws and work and you've got to have the foresight to think four and 10 years in advance. So those are some of my lessons. Right. I'm loving the, the theme that's coming across. Uh, uh, just love what you do, finding the joy, making that commitment. And so Tawana, uh, what about you? And what led you to your current career? And what lessons have you learned? Thank you for that question. It was really great to hear all the responses from um, my fellow colleagues on the call. Um, it's amazing to, to be here. I will say that I also started um, with a heart for service and that service started in my own household. I started taking care of my brothers at a very early age. I had to be a, a leader, um, not by choice, um, but by necessity at a very early age. And so I started developing those skills. Um, but I did identify that I wanted to run for office one day when I was placed in foster care. My foster father was a local city council member in Alabama. And that's when I first got to learn what a city council member um, did for the community, how it was public service, but it was also competitive. So you could serve your community, but only if the people selected you. And so you had to tell your story and represent yourself well so that you could be selected and in essence beat someone. Um, and so that was uh, really exciting um, to me. And I went on to study politics and government at the University of Puget Sound. Um, I got busy interning 
um, with Julie Anderson during my undergrad studies. I became the campaign manager for Mayor Victoria Woodards. I also co-hosted um, fundraisers in the community for um, then legislative candidates like um, now Speaker Lori Jenkins. And so I really started building my experience. I knew that one day I, I wanted to run for office. I wanted to be able to lead here in the community in Tacoma and in Pierce County. Um, but I felt more confident watching other people do it, watching amazing, strong women also do that here in our community. And so when I decided to run for school board because I was a teacher, passionate about education, I had multiple kids in public school, I kind of knew the ropes at that point um, and built an incredible team. And that same team helped me to also um, run for state senate. And I've learned so many things along the way. You have to be tough. You have to have tough skin. You definitely have to have a great emotional capacity and emotional maturity, but you also have to lead with love and kindness. You have to absolutely know that most people, um, I would argue all, but people want to feel value. They want to be heard. They want to be seen. And it really goes a long way to let someone know that you, you hear them you care about what they're saying and you simply want to be kind to them. And so I think that I each day try to win people over. Um, even folks who send me angry emails, I try to respond graciously. Um, and surprisingly people, well, some people respond back that they hate me still, but some people <laughs> respond back and they just feel grateful that I responded and saw their email and that they have a representative um, on the state level that is um, just responsive to their their needs. And I don't over, you know, promise, um, but I just let them know that I'm grateful that they're, you know, being a voice, being an advocate, you know, raising um, issues to my level that are important to them. So lots of lessons, but I'm just very grateful to have these amazing women who have been role models for me and just examples of of how to lead and graciously and tough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Tawana. Um, yeah, lead lead with love and kindness. Um, uh, just I just love that. And you you talk about you know watching other strong women and mentors. So I'm going to turn to Lori for this question. Um, what are some of the unique issues that women encounter? when running for office? And, and how have you navigated those issues? It, thanks, Donna. And it's so great to hear these stories, some of which I've heard before and others. Um, it's just, uh, I, I love to hear different paths, especially that women have taken, because there's a lot of different ways to do this. There's no single way to do it. I think one of the things that I see um, with uh, women running is that a lot of times women tend to run in midlife, choose to do it a little bit later in life, um, which is frequently driven by two different things. Many women have children and feel like they can't run while they while their kids are growing up. And that sometimes really relates to the sexism around running, right? People asking you, I mean, our son was nine when I ran um, and asking like, you know, well, what are you gonna, how, who's gonna take care of your son? And then it was very confusing to people when I said, well, my wife will. Um, that that also, <laughs> you know, right? You have different. I have different layers, as to, as does everyone here. Um, but I think that's one thing. But the other thing that you that we see with women, and I definitely experienced it, is feeling like you're an imposter, like you don't know enough, like you have to be perfectly understand every issue before you run. I can guarantee you that men do not think that way we hold ourselves to a very perfectionistic standard. And my guess is that there are women right now in their earlier mid twenties. And I wanna tell you, you are perfectly prepared to run for office right now. You are gonna, you are gonna learn more. You'll learn more stuff as did I, but you are prepared to run. Women don't wake up in the third grade like many of our presidents did and think I'm going to be president of the United States and then they're president of the United States that, that you know, <laughs> there haven't been any women who've done that yet. Um, but so I think that's a challenge. And then there's just lots of, there's lots of kind of challenges around historic sexism. I do want to talk about, I think, a couple of really great things. I think in the environment we're in right now, women tend to be more trusted than men as being uh, honest and forthright and our emotions being real when we show them. It's always a little dangerous for women to show emotion, but um, I just, 
I think that uh, Victoria and I maybe corner the market on crying, uh, crying electeds. I'm known as the crying asker people. <laughs> I get myself worked up when I'm asking for money for really great candidates and really great issues, and I end up getting very emotional. Um, and uh, you know, Victoria's uh, also had that experience. But um, so sometimes you have to be careful about that. But I think women are very trusted. I think one of the most important things for women to do as you think about running is to be, if you can be aware and present when you're experiencing sexism and you know that that's happening in an engagement, it's not always important that you say something about it, but it's important for you to understand. Let me just give an example and then I'll stop here. Um, this isn't so much about sexism, but I was very aware when I was running as the first, you know, there had been other lesbians who had run, but I was the first out lesbian elected to the state legislature. I was very aware that a lot of people thought that there was nothing more liberal or progressive than a lesbian. That was just a bias that they had. And I, that allowed me as a candidate to also move into some more um, nonpartisan, less progressive areas and stake out places because voters had no question about whether or not I was on the progressive end. And my being aware of that bias that people had also let me engage on other issues in different ways that, that you know, my opponent at the time had to really stake out his progressive values more than I did. So that I may be, I may have gone way off on this, but uh, anyway, that's my, that's my answer and I'm sticking to it. Great. Thank you. And uh, Victoria, um, what would you add to that um, in terms of just unique issues that women uh, running encounter uh, when they're running for office? So let me, in, in church, um, when someone says something and you agree, we just say amen. So amen to what Lori, what Speaker Jenkins just shared, and I, I could really stop there. Um, but I think there, I think there are a couple of things I could add to the conversation, and I think um, Lori really alluded to it, and that is really the self-confidence that we have in, our, in ourselves as women, not just to be perfect, but that that we don't believe that we're ready or we have the experience um and what 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 women tend to forget is um in a lot of cases we run the budgets in our household if you're a parent and you're taking care of kids and scheduling um and 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 tutoring and fee i mean when you're taking care of a household you are running a mini city and so i so i think that waiting until you think you have all that experience is, is is too long you can engage now and use all of those skills trust me um there is no way i mean i guess there's some way to prepare for elected office but but you don't really know what's going to happen until you get elected and so it really is those soft skills the issues will be the issues um, I tell people this all the time. You, you'll know some of the issues, but some of the issues you, you can't anticipate. I bet the four of us would have never anticipated that we would be leading through COVID. Um, through a, through, through a, you know, an, an international pandemic, a national pandemic, right? Nobody thought we would be here today. Um, but so I think it's really looking at the skills, the soft skills that you have are what you really need to rely on to run and and most of us and, and, a, and a lot of women have the natural ability to care about others empathy compassion those are those are leadership um being able to, to to step into the middle of chaos make sense out of it get everybody on the same page and move forward it's what we do every single day in our lives and so um so i just i just want to continue to encourage people so for me that's some of the things i that 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 i encountered or that that were important to me i i do want to say something Lori said is um that I that I didn't pay close attention to, and I think maybe as a woman of color, maybe it was out of some safety position or a way to, to protect myself. But um, while I absolutely know in every part of my life as I grew up, I was put in a situation where either as a woman or a woman of color, um, I wasn't treated like everyone else in the room. I wasn't called on like everyone else in the room. I wasn't talked to like everyone else in the room. While that happened, I think um, one of the, one of the ways I protected myself was to ignore it and pretend like it didn't exist. Um, mm -hmm. They've called on everyone around me. My hands still up. They're all men, and I'm a woman. That's not because I'm a woman. It's just because they didn't see me, right? And so we tend to excuse a lot of a lot of the behavior that happens. And so 
one one of the things that 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 I've learned, especially in the last couple of years, um, given the racial uprising that's happened across the country, is that you do have to bring it to people's attention, and you don't have to be rude about it. But I think that that when when there are missteps, there are there is a way to educate people um, on how to treat you that is really really important. Um, so that that's that's just kind of where I will leave that for now. I mean, one thing's clear is, you know, women don't have to wait uh, that, you know, if you have that self-confidence, if you have that commitment, um, because you're not going to know all the answers, um, but, you, but you, have a, you have a lot that you can already get started, you, that you have a lot uh, going for you, as uh, we have a lot going for us yeah, as women. Yeah, if, if I could just add another thing, I just like kind of the how you got through it. I do want to say, so for me, again, number one, a lot of prayer. But 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 in addition to that, I will say this. Um, that I look at these three women on the screen, the, or the four of you on the screen, and really getting a village of people around you that you can call. I mean, Lori, Lori talks about us crying. Lori has heard me cry. So has so has Julie, and so has Tawan. I mean, right? And not just crying in a public way, but crying and saying, "I can't handle this. I need some help. I need some." I mean, so it it takes really this village, and I know you're going to get into that a little bit more, but it really does take this village. And I, again, I'll be grateful that these women are part of my village. And that uh, that's perfect, actually, because it leads us into the the last question before we turn it over for questions from the audience. And um, I we have about sixty people that are viewing, and if you have questions, please remember you can submit those questions to clsr at uw.edu. So um, you'll have a chance in just a few moments. Uh, and this next question to really um, take what uh, Victoria talked about in, in terms of needing a village and those relationships. Uh, Tuana, during the preparations, well, actually both Tuana and Julie, you mentioned this as we were talking and preparing for this event, it became clear that relationships, uh, mentoring and coaching played an important role. Uh, in your all of our in your lives, and so Tuana, we'll start with you. Can you give an example of how this has helped you in your career, and how you provide this support to others? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did mention a little bit earlier in in my remarks that each of um, the women here, um, my fellow elected officials, have played a significant role in my journey to becoming. Um, a school board director and a state senator, and honestly, just <laughs> a better version of myself um, today um, as a woman in our in our community and a leader in our community. But I think by asking for opportunity, by showing up and being available, by showing that I simply care also about our our community, and I wanted to support women, so it wasn't it wasn't just so that I could gain anything. I wanted um, to be around other elected leaders or just other women leading because they were awesome, because they were smart. And I wanted to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that if I'm supporting someone that's um, running for office or if I'm working for someone that's running for office, that I'm doing it because I believe in this other woman. Um, I believe in what she stands for. And so some of the mentorship isn't question and answer, sitting over coffee, can we, well, Zoom wasn't back in the day when I when I met um, these women, but it wasn't, can I jump on a Zoom call and um, spend some time with you, but it was very informal and it was me just watching from the sidelines, the incredible work that these women are doing, like that was mentorship in addition to formal mentorship of, you know, working for and interning with and I really try to give back. I mean, I am working um, with some colleagues in our own time this weekend even to put on a program called Build a Bench where we're gonna talk to folks who are interested in running for office. So it'll be with a fellow Senator and someone from um, a local democratic group. I also um, have taken the time to call candidates who are running and encourage them. There have been several candidates um, who have called me and just really asked me questions. Um, or vent and say like, is it just me? And I can tell them, no, it's not just you. Trust me, there were people, there were my own um, 
top five or, you know, top people or folks who I, I thought would always support me, who did not support me either or right away. And yes, I had folks who had not donated. And yes, it gets stressful if you're approaching those, you know, um, fundraising deadlines, just all these, you know, all these answers that a lot of people have who want to be here. But I also do a lot of talking to groups, um, groups of women, co-ed groups, non-binary groups about um, just what it's like to have an idea that you want to serve your community in this way and what it's like once you're in this seat. So if I have it to give, I really try to give it to community, but I never stop learning from other leaders, from other women, whether informally or formally. I just admire so many incredible folks. And if they have um, characteristics that I think I truly admire, I really want to adopt them as my own. You know, if I, the things that I learn, I really want to adopt those things um, as my own and, um, and show up in community in those same ways. But I just, I forever will be a learner. I hope that I always will be mentored by um, women who are younger and older than me, less and more seasoned than I, you know, will be. Um, because I think successful women truly support other women. Like that to me is a true demonstration of leadership. You, you build your network of women that you are supporting and that are supporting you. Absolutely. And so, Julie, do you have anything to add to that in terms of, um, you know, the relationships and, and how it has helped you in your career? Well, first of all, I think it's been about 18 years since Senator Nobles interned with me. <laughs> and I'm listening to her and watching her on screen right now. I'm like, a cold sweat across my brow because oh I was influencing her 18 years ago good grief what was I doing what was she seeing me do um I'm glad it worked out for you um the other thing that I would add is um the deepest relationships that I have with women in public service are formed um during the side gigs so not on the dais not uh at work, uh, in functioning as elected officials, but um, you know, attending funerals together, uh, neighborhood trash pickups, um, advocacy campaigns that don't necessarily have to do with what we're working on in the office, uh, where you build that deeper trust. And I don't really like the terms like coaching and mentoring because it sounds so hierarchical. The best support that I think that we give to each other is as um, friends um, and allies who can learn from each other's perspectives. And it's in its truest sense, it's just friendship in those times of need when Mayor Woodard needs a shoulder to cry on over the phone. And she knows that that support is unconditional uh, and not because of the position that I hold and vice versa. So my advice to people who are going to be in public service is to you know pursue what you you love follow your joy but um, also cultivate those relationships on the sidelines um, and have that kind of a network that's not so much about collecting votes and endorsements and so less transaction and more mutual support Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. I mean, I, I could sit and just chat with you all day long. I, I think you're all phenomenal women. So we have some questions for the audience. Hey, um, Donna, Donna, can I just yes. add one quick thing in yes. here? Because no one's really talked about this, but I'm I'm one of the things is you have to find you have to find these allies who will tell you the truth, mm -hmm. especially when you're running for office and when you've been elected, there is a tendency for people to just reinforce whatever you've said even when you've actually made a mistake and you should be you should be doing something else and so one of the but with people who are willing to for me willing to say to you Lori I think that might have not been quite right let's try to figure out how let me try to help you figure out how to write yourself in this um how can I support you in that but it doesn't help if all I have around me is people who are like, right, you're right, Lori, you're right, you're right, you're right. No, I'm not always right. And I need, I, that's what's most important to me now in the role that I'm in is actually people who I trust being willing to tell me that maybe there was a different approach that I should consider. 
Absolutely. Having that, that's part of having that support, right? Having the support is uh, trusting that the women around you are going to uh, give you that honest uh, feedback. Wonderful. So we have a, a great, we have about five questions. Uh, and we finish up at about 120, so we still have a little bit of time. So the first question, I'm going to direct this question to Victoria. Um, uh, during one of your comments, Victoria, you addressed how diplomacy sometimes means ignoring something in the moment. Uh, we all know sometimes we get our backs up and want to let the rage out. So in, in the moment, what do you do with that? Now, I know you're a woman of faith. Right. <laughs> yes, but I'm still a human being and a woman. So um, I, I think for me in the moment, the first thing I do is I stop and I take a deep breath. Um, I, I, I just kind of have to take a deep breath and swallow. And then I need to decide in that moment, what do I want the outcome to be? Um, I, Michelle Obama said it, but I've been living it for a long time. When they go low, I would say, we just don't go high, we go higher. Um, and so I, I really, and, and Tawana's smiling, I tell her that all the time. Um, but, but, but so you have to take a deep breath and in that moment, I can choose to react. Um, and sometimes, you know, even I recognize it walking away or I can say, what, what, how do I wanna approach this? What do I wanna learn? Number one, is this worth my time and energy? Is it worth allowing someone to steal my joy in this moment? And then, and then sometimes it is, right? Because there are moments when people need to be educated. So, so first of all, deep breath, figure out what you want the outcome to be. What are you trying to get across? How are you trying to, to set yourself up for success? Um, and, and then that gives you some clarity about how to move forward. Now in situations I've said, excuse me, but I really need to address that here in the moment. And I calm down because it's, there's no good yelling and screaming. That's not going to get you absolutely anywhere. Nobody will, will hear you. And sometimes the more upset someone else gets, the calmer I get, because it's really hard to yell at you or be angry at you when you're talking very calmly to someone. We all do it with kids. I mean, right? When a kid's screaming and yelling, you don't scream and yell back at the kid. You go, okay, I'm going to need you to calm down. And so, so doing that, and then, and, and then in other times, just taking a deep breath and allowing that ignorance to pass and then to come back being myself. Because sometimes people do that and want you to react. And I never believe in giving people what they want in that kind of situation. Wonderful. Thank you. So this question, um, uh, any one of you can can answer this. Uh, do you have role models in, uh, in key moments of your life, uh, be it uh, whether that be during childhood, uh, university, or working? Um, who and how do they influence you to be who you are today? Um, so I don't know who wants to jump in. Uh, we've got, we've, uh, the questions are rolling in, so I don't know how many we can get in between now and 120. We've got 10 more minutes left. So um, uh, anyway, who would like to start? I can take this one um, because um, Black women have been the greatest role model in my life. And when I think back to, um, as I mentioned, when uh, my brothers and I experienced foster care, when we lived in shelters and we're experiencing homelessness, I um, up, up to my introduction to Mayor Woodards and our continued um, relationship, I just have been directly mentored by and indirectly mentored by Black women and have been able to formulate how I wanted to see myself and how I wanted to show up in community um, by watching Black women. And I remember when I lived in a shelter in Alabama and the woman who ran the shelter, she would always have one earring off um, during her work day. And I don't think then I understood why. And then when I sat behind my big oak wood desk that I inherited from uh, Mayor Woodards when she was the CEO of the Urban League, and now I'm the CEO, and it was it's the original desk of Mr. Thomas Dixon. But when I sit there and have a long day of cell phone calls or when we were in the office and not working remotely, just picking up the phone, and it gets painful when your phone is pressing against your earring as you're talking to people and just handling business. And so when I started taking my earring off, it just made so much sense of like, that is why she would have her earring off. But watching her in her office with her large desk and all of her books behind her, watching her run a business, I started seeing myself as one day being a businesswoman in my community and running a nonprofit and 
being able to offer a service to um, to community and with community and um, just the women from my sorority. I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Two of them were my math teachers. And I remember how just kind and gracious they were. And they would bring me little things to school because we, at that time, we were still experiencing um, homelessness. Um, but I was very smart and still very cute. And, um, um, but I had such a bad attitude. And so my brokenness was just, you know, truly exposed, but they would bring me things like handbags or do these little special things for me um, and just encourage me and tell me when I was wearing too much makeup. But I just feel like throughout my life, black women have modeled what it means to show up as such a beautiful, gracious, loving force in this community. And I'm just very grateful that I've been able to see that um, and know, and, and like I said, be able to design and think about um, what I wanted to emulate and, and what the type of beautiful person that I wanted to try to be. And as Mayor Woodard said, she still has to tell me, go higher, go higher. So I'm still working on it, but I have women like her who just have, have gotten so far, even emotionally, and they still get to, um, lend me a helping hand when I need it. But Black women have been my rock and will continue to. Thank you. Any Anybody else or I could go to another question? I'll go to another question. <laughs> so this one, um, how do you go, go about being your own cheerleader to get opportunities out there and not have it seem like you're bragging or being egotistical about your accomplishments? Who wants to jump in with that one, Julie? You're not you're you're not doing your own brags. You're celebrating citizens. It, we're 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 all just cogs in the wheel of democracy and public participation. So anything that uh, I get to celebrate is as a result of work of citizens, right? Uh, in and so it's not it's not about you uh, when you're celebrating success or reaching for the next thing. You've got to be centered on your constituents, your neighbors, your residents, and your citizens. And I mean, look, I'm just smiling, just thinking about it. We, we live in a great country, great communities, and uh, the people that come into our office have just tremendous stories, even when they're doing the most menial tasks. And I just like celebrating them. So don't be shy, you know? Great, thank you. Anybody want, else wanna add to that? Or I can go to one more one more question. Um, let's see. For women uh, in the community who aspire to serve in increasingly leadership spaces in the workforce and in the community in general, can can um, any of the panelists remark on any differences in approaches or perspective to leadership for women who don't aspire necessarily to seek elected office? Be a lobbyist. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's funny that all four of us are like, what? That can't, no, that can't be possible. Um, uh, but I, I do recognize that it, it, that it is possible. And I think actually all of the things that have been said apply to women who are trying to ascend in a corporate world. Um, uh, you know, like I have both a political job and then an operational job of running the House of Representatives. Is I'm the buck stops with me, so I'm both an executive and in this kind of really political realm too. Um, one of the things that I see is uh, women generally, uh, not all women, but we tend to like distributed power a little bit more, and it may very much be because we haven't had very much, and so we're not really into accumulating at all. We're into like making sure everybody has some and um, and jointly making decisions. And I think that's been, you know, a shift in, for me in leadership in the house. But, um, but I, I think all this advice applies to trying to rise no matter what you do, connecting to your community, connecting to your coworkers, uh, having good support uh, around you, having confidence in yourself, knowing not, you know, knowing when you start to give yourself messages about being an imposter in that job, you're not an imposter, you're just having a hard moment. Um, and then you call your, you call your friends um, and, and, uh, and, and ask them to help you and they do. Um, so I think that that's, I think the big difference in elective office may be the public exposure 
that's a that can be a very different thing depending on the the leadership post that you're looking for in a nonprofit or a, a in the corporate sector. But I think this advice is really good, no matter how you choose to lead. And hopefully, the women who are here on this call will choose to lead in all of the areas possible because we need women's leadership everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, I'm mindful that this event is being hosted by the Center for Social, you know, Social Responsibility and Leadership at the UW, where um, all of these qualities and challenges that we've been talking about are present no matter what sector uh, you are living in. Uh, hopefully, you're leading your company or your coworkers um, and paying attention to public good and being socially responsible and mindful. And I don't think that that's much different than being an elected official, just, just some very, I don't wanna say minor differences, but um, agreed, Speaker Jenkins. Great, so we just have a couple of minutes left. And uh, just what is one fun fact about yourself that may not be uh, able, that no, we wouldn't be able to find online or in public records. Anything you're willing to share? Um, I was, oh wait, that you couldn't find public records. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was born in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, I don't know that that is public records, but I was born abroad. And I can say ich liebe dich. And if for anyone that speaks German, if I didn't pronounce it correctly, that's fine. I learned that when I was like three. <laughs> I took German for eleven for no, not eleven because I took German for four years, and you and you said it right. Um, <laughs> and um, I would say a fun fact that people probably don't know. People, most people know I was in the military. What a lot of people don't know that I was an expert marksman in the military. Now, I, I don't own a gun, haven't picked up a gun in a really long time, but when I was in the military, I was, I was an expert, and I actually was uh, an armor in the military, so I took care of M16s and 38s and could take, take them apart, oil them, and put them back together. I'm taking the mayor to the range. <laughs> That's true. I, um, I, I'll just start with our newest announcement. We are grandparents of a kitty. So that's news. Our son, our son, 21 year old has a kitty. There's lots of things about me. I'm an avid backpacker. Um, next year, I'll finish up the Washington section of the Pacific Crest Trail with goals to do the whole thing uh, over time. And uh, I also, uh, every holiday season, if you're around me, I make all of my grandmother's uh, holiday candy recipes. Um, and I think I'm the only one in my extended family who does that. Yes, Mayor Woodards, I will get you the toffee. I was like, I need to come off mute to be very clear. I had it for the first time last year. I, I want to get in early this year. <laughs> well, great. Well, Julie, you have got something to add really quickly. <laughs> Some, something that I want to add to the public record. I don't know, trivia, my first rum, rumor has it that my um, first language was Japanese and I don't speak it or understand it now. <laughs> Well, great. Well, this has been absolutely so much fun for me to spend some time with all of you. Um, so many takeaways uh, from, you know, all of you just doing this because you love your community. Uh, you're wanting to have a life of service. Um, and it's important that we support each other, uh, that we're honest with each other. Uh, and uh, the love what you do, love what you do. And uh, I think Julie was the first one to say this about um, finding joy. Uh, and I think finding joy is so critical uh, and celebrating, uh, celebrating, celebrating the work that, that you're doing on behalf of, of citizens in our community. Um, so I would like to thank uh, Dean Merchant and the Center for Social Responsibility and Leadership uh, for hosting uh, this just spectacular um, series. And again, thank you to uh, Victoria, Julie, Tawana, and Lori for being a part of uh, today's uh, session. So have a great afternoon, everyone.